Well, greetings. My name is Daniel Ray. I am a staff apologist and researcher with Watchman.org. We are a nonprofit interfaith evangelism organization. We reach out to Mormons, Jehovah's Witnesses, Muslims, and people of other worldviews and faiths, including skeptics and atheists. And this video is going to be a little different. I am going to put myself through a street epistemology conversation. So Daniel does street epistemology on himself. There is a timestamp uh, catalog below in the notes. If you want to skip through to the various questions and things, you can go right to them uh, with the timestamp catalog down there in the notes. So I am not going to straw man the SEP's position. SEP, if you're not familiar, is the street epistemology practitioner. So this is not an attempt to straw man the SEP's position, but simply list straightforward questions I have heard SEPs ask Christians. And these are some of the questions that I have been asked by street epistemologists. And to be fair, I've tried limiting my responses to what I would say off the top of my head in an impromptu conversation. In other words, if I was in a park or a public place, and somebody came up to me and asked me to, to do a street epistemology conversation. I don't have my notes. I have, wasn't prepared. That kind of thing. Um, I don't include block quotes in this. I don't include anything from notes. I did not look up anything in the making of these slides. My answers are what's in my mind as I write and what I would say in an impromptu street epistemology conversation. So I've tried to keep that part uh, genuine and realistic as well. And just a heads up in advance, insulting, mocking comments will be deleted and your account will be muted or blocked from this channel. I have enough <laughs> nonsense that I, I see in social media. I don't need it on this channel. If you want to leave a civil or thoughtful criticism, that's fine. But multi, uh, you know, mocking and insulting comments are just going to be deleted and you'll be muted or blocked. But if you would like to converse about this video in a civil manner, you can drop me a line at psalm1968 at gmail.com. That's my public email, psalm1968 at gmail.com. Uh, if you have a YouTube channel and you'd like to interview me about anything in this video, that's fine. Maybe we can set up a time. Maybe we can just strike up a uh, pen pal conversation through email. Whatever you'd like to do. But if you have uh, would like to have a civil conversation about anything in this video, contact me through my public email there, psalm1968 at gmail.com. All right. On to the questions. Question one, what is your deeply held belief, Daniel? I believe in Jesus Christ, that he is Lord, fully God and fully man. He is the second person of the Trinity of Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. I believe Jesus lived a sinless life, took upon himself the penalty of our breaking God's law, which is death, and gave us both his righteousness, he lived perfectly in accordance with the law, and victory over sin and death by his own death on the cross. Question two, what is the main reason you believe in Jesus? Well, there are many reasons. The main reason, I think, is Jesus himself. He is arguably the most widely discussed individual, perhaps the central figure of all human history. If he was lying, he was still brilliant. If he was just made up, his fabricators pulled off the most fantastic hoax ever concocted. The most realistic answer for me is that he is who he said he is. The Son of God, the Son of Man, I am, one with the Father. I believe his existence is near as certain as any historical figure can be. If his disciples were mistaken... There is finally no satisfactory historical record which accounts for what really happened in first century Palestine. Question three. What method did you use to conclude these things about Jesus? I didn't use any particular method. I don't think it's that simple. It's difficult to articulate, to be honest. While the analogy falls short on several levels, I would say that I know Jesus similarly to how I would know anyone they would have to reveal something about themselves to me. So, for example, the Father revealed his Son to me through the agency of the Holy Spirit. Now, that's my understanding as Scripture interprets it, but when that happened, I couldn't tell you almost 30 years ago. 
uh, exactly how that happened. But it, this is in Matthew 16, where Peter confesses Jesus as the Christ, the Son of the living God, and that Jesus tells Peter that flesh and blood did not reveal that to Peter, but the Father, who is in heaven. So that's how my faith in Christ began. In my mid-twenties, I knew nothing about Jesus or the Bible. And then I started reading the Bible and just keeping a journal. I did what any of us would do and started asking questions about what it all meant. And that process of asking questions and looking into why I believe and what I believe has lasted 29 years this month. March of 2022 is my 29th year in the Christian faith. It includes personal experience, a lot of personal experience, and exploring Christianity and other claims and other worldviews. And Jesus comes up a lot in other religions and worldviews, by the way. Okay, so on a scale of 0 to 100, 0 being no confidence and 100 being completely confident, where are you in your belief about Jesus? I am confident Jesus is Lord and that he existed. I personally find little epistemic value in trying to quantify my confidence, to be honest. To me, that is something like asking how many ounces my ideas weigh. I don't think it says much, personally. So I'm just confident in what I believe. Okay, so you are confident, all right. You mentioned other religions a moment ago. What would you say to someone who is confident Vishnu or Allah exists? Good questions. First, because my worldview incorporates the reality of the supernatural, I would say that my Hindu or Islamic friends likely have had some kind of supernatural experience, a genuine supernatural experience of some kind. But that being said, I would compare the nature of their gods to Jesus, as I have done, and examine the history of how their scriptures were compiled. So, for example, the Bhagavad Gita was allegedly compiled over 5,000 years ago, by a literary avatar of Vishnu, Krishna. The International Society of Krishna Consciousness, however, believes Krishna is supreme and that Vishnu is his avatar. Now, the Vaishnavite sect of Hinduism believe just the opposite, that Vishnu is supreme and Krishna is his avatar. But the Vishnu Krishna god is a little sexually indulgent. There are stories of him uh, taking on an avatar of a blue dwarf or something like that, a blue or a black dwarf, and having um, sexual liaisons with milkmaids. And uh, Vishnu Krishna can take many forms, animals. Um, there is very little historical context to support the events in the Bhagavad Gita unlike Christianity. And unlike the Gospels, there are no historically identifiable eyewitnesses who have seen what is recorded in the Bhagavad Gita or have seen the avatars of Vishnu or Krishna. And for Islam, Muhammad never left a successor, unlike Jesus and the apostles. No one else had ever seen the revelation of the angel as Muhammad did. And Muhammad is the only witness to the angel Gabriel who allegedly dictated the text of the Quran to him word for word unlike the Bible where there are multiple authors and witnesses. The Quran does encourage Muslims to go to the Gospels, what is called the Injil in the Quran, and obey the commands of Isa, who is Jesus. But yet, the Quran also says that the Bible is corrupted, and this is a problem for Islam, because you can ask, when was the Bible corrupted? Was it corrupted before Muhammad? Then why would Allah recommend Muslims consult the Injil? If after Muhammad, then why don't Muslims accept the Bible we have today? Because the Bible we have today is based on manuscripts that predate Muhammad by centuries. So those are just a couple of problems uh, with Islam that I see. But ultimately, side-by-side -side comparisons reveal that in the Bible, you have a much more authentically historical, hands-on, publicly open compilation of personal testimonials of people who have encountered the true God of the universe. Question seven. So, okay, if someone doesn't believe in any gods and they see the differences between Hinduism, Islam, and Christianity, how can they know which is true? Okay, first, if the individual is utterly convinced that God doesn't exist and or wants nothing to do with God, then nothing I say will satisfy their criteria and the conversation progresses infinitely in their attempts to discredit everything I say. When I see that people refuse to concede that anything I share has any epistemic or evidential merit, 
it is clear to me they are not really interested in knowing if God exists, and I'll usually end the conversation at that point. For example, I have had a few SE conversations where the SEP said they were very interested in what I believed about Jesus. And then when I did share what I believed, come to find out they weren't interested in it at all. Uh, So there it is clear, their initial interests were not sincere. But there are two examples from the Bible that I can give that I think may answer this question somewhat. Um, The Pharisees came to Jesus with questions, but not because they were interested in receiving him or believing in him, but they were simply interested in trapping him and justifying themselves. And then there's the story of Zacchaeus climbing a tree, for example. He was short of stature, the Bible says, and he climbed a fig tree to see Jesus as Jesus was passing by. So, two things. If you want to find a way to trap and discredit Jesus, you will. Remember that he was crucified after all. He gave himself over to his enemies. But if you want to find a way to see him as Savior and Lord, you will. What the difference is between the Pharisees and Zacchaeus, I don't claim to know. So in short, there are plenty of trees to climb, so to say, if you want to see who Jesus really is. And finally, for me, that I know about Jesus, I think, is really a gift, a matter of grace, something I did not seek or deserve. And somehow in my mid-twenties, I found myself willing to believe, whereas before then, I was not willing to believe. I thought Christians were silly. (laughs) Nice people, but silly. How that worked, I don't have a clue. I I have no idea. I can explain to you as the scriptures describe a conversion experience, and I can find similarities in scripture to my own, but the sort of the technical details about how I went from being unwilling to believe to willing to believe, I I don't even know myself. Um, And I think that gets to the gist of John chapter 3. And Jesus' conversation with Nicodemus, where Jesus talks about the Holy Spirit like the wind. The Spirit moves in ways we cannot fully comprehend. So question eight. So if I understand you correctly, you believe that knowing if a God claim is true is to examine the claims. Uh, Do you think that is a reliable way to know if God exists, though? Yes, I do. I think everybody has to examine the claims. How else are we going to know? But in saying that, I don't think there's some sort of magical method or formula. We are a highly technical society which has become blindly accustomed to automation technologies that we can get virtually anything we want. I mean, we're dispensing cars from a car dispenser now uh, that we can just build the right machine or push the right buttons and we can get virtually anything we want at any time. But I don't see God being like that in any tradition of which I'm aware. God is not a push-button automatic, I do these things and God suddenly reveals himself. It just just doesn't work that way. But to the question specifically, again, yes, I think examining the claims themselves is absolutely essential for how you get to know who God is. It is just one part of the process. Though I cannot fully explain it in technical details, how we become willing to receive or to know that God exists, I, I don't know. That, that's a great mystery, like John chapter 3. We can see the effects of the wind, but we don't know where it's coming from or where it's going. Question 9, so do you think it's possible that someone can examine the claims and be willing to accept God's existence, but still not believe in him? It's a good question, and in short, my answer is no. Um, but it's not up to me to judge someone's willingness or unwillingness. I can't know what's going on inside a person Even Jesus says that many who call him Lord will not enter into the kingdom of heaven. So I believe only God knows the human heart, and God's judgment upon human hearts is that we all suppress the truth of his existence in unrighteousness. So someone might say, I'm willing to believe, but I don't. Or someone might say, I believe, but secretly they don't. Um, We can deceive ourselves, um, but the Bible indicts all of us. Uh, in that we suppress the truth of God in unrighteousness. So according to what God says about us, no one by themselves is authentically willing to believe. Unbelief is a systemic problem because of our sin. Question 10. So you believe God's judgment comes from the Bible, is that correct? Is that how you know what God thinks of the human heart? Correct. But this is not, I believe the Bible because I want to, or I believe the Bible because the Bible says it's true. 
Jesus pre-existed his word. As I said, my original claim and, and why I believe in Jesus is Jesus himself. Jesus pre-exists his word as the creator of the universe. His word is true because of who he is. Jesus is self-authenticating. He needs no further justification beyond himself. That is the nature of his name and his being. I am the, the name of Yahweh. Jesus is Yahweh of the Old Testament. He is the I am. In terms of scripture, there is historical and archaeological support for what's written in the Bible. The Bible was not compiled in a cultural vacuum. It wasn't written by one person. It wasn't given dictatively by an angel. It wasn't written 5,000 years ago when no one else was around to see it. Um, there is good reason to accept the Bible as history. As Paul tells Festus in Acts, these things were not done in a corner referring to the resurrection, of course. So, for example, take any common objection to the historical accounts of Jesus' resurrection and ask yourself, if the resurrection did not happen, as described in the Bible, then what is the reason for why we have the New Testament at all? And whatever your answer is, can your reasoning be supported with at least as much textual evidence as we have for the resurrection itself? And the answer is no. They are all purely hypothetical speculations that have no historical or textual support. I have spoken personally with both Dr. Gary Habermas, who is the world's leading expert on the history of the resurrection, and I have spoken personally for a few minutes with Dr. Bart Ehrman about this very subject. Dr. Ehrman speculates the disciples were simply mistaken, but he provides no historical evidence for his speculation. In other words, there's not a embarrassment of riches from texts and other uh, sources of history that would show uh, that the, the disciples were mistaken. He, Dr. Ehrman is simply speculating that they were because he does not accept the resurrection. Dr. Habermas has compiled a list of historical facts about Jesus that are nearly indisputable among scholars who study them. And we just did a podcast on that. And I will link the podcast um, and the video where I talked to Dr. Ehrman in the links below if you want to see that. While neither scholar provides absolute 100% testable empirical proof for their position, I think Ehrman has far less evidence for his idea than Habermas does for his, I think there is more historical credibility to the resurrection. Okay, so you mentioned testing there. Is there a way, any way, to test these conclusions you've come to about Jesus? Well, I think, for one, history in general, not just the Bible, but history in general, lies outside the bounds of empirical testability in many respects. You can't repeat the events of the past in a laboratory. You have to work with the clues left to us by our ancestors. So, for example, my mom is a Pearl Harbor survivor. She was an infant when she was there, and the stories that she was told were told by her sister, who was older at the time, my aunt, who has passed away, and her parents. Um, so the only tangible proof that I have of my mom surviving the attack on Pearl Harbor is that of her testimony that she received from her own family because she doesn't remember the events herself, um, her birth certificate of being born in Honolulu. And um, there are no living eyewitnesses presently that can account for her being there. But uh, we do have a newspaper article from the Columbus Dispatch, Columbus, Ohio. Her family was from Ohio. Um, so I have my mom's testimony. I have a newspaper account, um, but I don't have any other living eyewitnesses other than my mom. Um, does this, this scant amount of evidence mean that my mom was not at Pearl Harbor the day it was bombed on December 7th, 1941? Well, of course not. There's an issue of reliability of the eyewitnesses, a trust, and, and a textual document. So I have my mom's testimony, and I have this text from the Columbus Dispatch. And the Columbus Dispatch, like the Gospels, is, is, is a, a newspaper that was widely disseminated in, the, in, in and around the Columbus area, just like the Gospels were widely disseminated in and around the Mediterranean, and it, it was public information. Uh, so anybody could look into those things uh, for themselves if they so chose. So if the Gospels were fabricated or if the disciples were mistaken, um, as these letters of the New Testament were circulating throughout the Greco-Roman world in the Mediterranean, people would have had ample opportunity to come forth and discredit the accounts given by the apostles. So this brings up the idea of falsifiability. Um, I hear a lot of street epistemologists use this. 
And even in the physical sciences, it is never entirely clear that certain concepts can be completely falsified, uh, especially in the area of cosmogony and cosmology. Cosmogony deals with the origin of the universe. You can't falsify what happened when the universe came into being or how it did come into being. Everybody has a multitude of different theories about this. Um, there are variations on the Big Bang or what came, quote unquote, before the Big Bang, uh, things of this nature. You can't do an experiment and falsify what happened. You can run computer simulations, but those simulations begin on certain premises that the researcher assumes from the beginning. So if you come to a different conclusion than your, your colleagues, maybe you started with a different mathematical equation. You started with a different assumption about what the universe looked like uh, when it began. And so it's not that you necessarily falsify a theory, but that you just begin with a certain different set of premises, or maybe you miscalculated, or you plugged in your own biases to something. So even in the sciences, falsifiability is not infallible. It's useful, but it's not the only way that we can know if something is true or reliable. So like I said, one person starts with a set of assumptions that differs from his colleagues. Maybe the equations are different, the measurements are different, biases creep in. You can't even falsify the idea that something must be falsifiable in order for it to be reliable. Question 12. So is there anything that might lower your confidence in your belief in Jesus? Oh yes, certainly. First of all, my own sin, fear, bad coffee, a terrible tragedy, loss of health, job, financial trouble, being humiliated, depression, a bad mood, doubt, unbelief, anger, frustrations of many kinds, my own hypocrisy, questioning my own salvation, speculating about what-if scenarios, a failed relationship or a marriage, problems in church, war, natural disasters, evil in myself and others, or suffering in general. I will fully admit that my confidence is frail and subject to a multitude of dangers within and without. But thankfully, the truth of what I believe and Jesus knowing me is not impacted by my fluctuating moods or confidence. Well, the Apostle Peter, of course, uh, he was confident that he would never deny Jesus. He'd be 100%, if you want to use the, the numerical scale, 100% confident he would never deny Jesus. But he did three times. And I understand that, and I think the more you progress and mature in the Christian faith, the more you realize <laughs> just how frail uh, we are as human beings and just how many things can, can set us doubting. And so it's not my confidence that makes my belief true. My belief is true no matter if I have no confidence in it. Uh, the sermon this morning, the pastor said that um, when we are faithless, he is faithful. Jesus remains faithful to us. And the older I get and the more frail I become and the more I start losing my mind and recognizing my own sin and frailty, the more wonderful God's grace and faithfulness to me becomes. So yes, there's a multitude of things that can reduce my confidence. If, if you want to pick them apart one by one, uh, you will find a, a, I have a host of journals <laughs> where my confidence goes up and down like a roller coaster. But, uh, but God has been faithful for 29 years in keeping me going. So I think it shows that it's all him and not me, finally. Question 13. In the beginning, you mentioned personal experience is one way you know that Jesus is real. Do you think personal experience is a good way to know if something is true? Absolutely. We are persons who experience the world in which we live. We cannot escape having personal experiences. If you deny personal experience as a legitimate way to know anything, it seems to render knowing as nearly impossible. So the question is whether our experiences correspond to what is true about the world we inhabit. But since none of us have an exhaustive, omniscient perspective of reality, judging our experiences based upon reality is epistemically limiting. So what do we do? So I'll contrast two, two worldviews, a materialist worldview or a naturalist worldview and a Christian or theistic worldview. If you're a materialist or a naturalist, you cannot say that we as human beings were designed or that we have any higher purpose. Many naturalists will say that such apparent design and purpose are illusory, despite our instincts to the contrary. So if you're a naturalist or materialist, you look at the eye or the human body, it looks like the heart and the eye and the lungs were designed for certain purposes. But under naturalism or materialism, we are told that such design is illusory and that it can all be explained by natural selection. But the naturalist will concede that a mannequin or artificial intelligence or a human-looking robot 
are the product of design and purpose. The mannequin functions to display the latest fashions, and robots and AIs serve a variety of different purposes, depending on the designer's intentions. But it would be an insult to the engineers at MIT who design and build AI or robots to say that those things are not intelligently designed. Yet human beings are far more intricate and wondrously enigmatic than the best robots or AI, yet we are supposedly all just here by accident. No design, no purpose, no meaning. So that's just one way in which I think personal experience in looking at design in the universe, it's, it's just one example, um, helps me to, to differentiate between the kinds of personal experiences people have. And denying that we are designed is a very common aspect to atheism or materialism. Um, and I find that to be exactly in line with what Scripture says in suppressing God's truth in unrighteousness, telling us that the universe wasn't designed, that we aren't designed, that there is no teleology in the physical world. Um, in my experience, my personal experience, I see the opposition to this idea of design and God's existence all the time, and this is exactly what Scripture says that we are to expect from people that do not believe. So I think personal experience is inescapable. Um, my standard for understanding my reality is not my understanding of reality. My understanding of reality comes from who Jesus is, and my understanding of reality and even my understanding of Christ is very limited. I'm not saying I know everything because I know who Jesus is. Jesus is the only one who knows the world omnisciently. I do not, but I place my trust in him knowing that he knows better and more and differently than I do. And so I measure my understanding of reality based on who Jesus is and what he has revealed. But I don't think we can uh, dismiss personal experience as, as completely unreliable because that's how we all know things, through personal experience. So to me, life seems to be designed to be personal. The God in whom I believe is personal. He became one of us. So might our personal experiences be untrustworthy or misleading? Of course, absolutely. But that doesn't seem to prevent us from formulating confident conclusions about the world in which we live. And for my two cents, Christianity is the best explanation for why the world is the way it is. Trusting in the one who created everything is a reasonable thing to do, I think. And in addition, I find atheist alternatives lacking. If I gave up my faith in Christ, for example, what does atheism offer in return? More skepticism and doubt? I already have enough of that as it is. Why would I want more? But I see a lot of people leaving Christianity, but but not for something else. They just think that Christianity isn't true, but they don't have a, a larger all-encompassing or better picture of reality to which they are turning. They just leave Christianity, and then they start to try to figure things out. And to me, that's a big thing, that, that if, you, if you leave something, that you have another place to go to some, to some extent. Um, and so I don't see there being any real viable, uh, all-encompassing alternative worldviews that have the explanatory scope and power uh, 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 that Christianity does. And uh, so that's my other reason for um, believing. So question 14, usually the, the SCP will wrap up and say, okay, thanks for your time. Um, and they might ask, uh, do you have any questions for me? So these are all sort of rhetorical. Um, I don't have the SCP answering these in this video, um, but I provide this for SCPs who are watching. Uh, several questions that you can answer yourself, you can leave in the comments if they are civil, or you can contact me and we can talk more about them. So these are, if you are a street epistemologist and you're watching this video, these are for you to answer. As an atheist, do you think there are any good reasons for believing in God? And how does that inform your SE conversations with Christians? Are you using street epistemology to try to get me to doubt? If you are just curious about my beliefs and want to explore them further, what are you going to do with what I have shared with you and why? Do you care about me and what I believe? Or am I just sort of content for your channel or just sort of an object on which you practice street epistemology? Do you think by practicing street epistemology with me, do you think you're helping me? And if so, in what way? Have you tried falsifying your belief 
that something cannot be trustworthy or reliable if it can't be falsified? If so, how did you do that? How do you personally define God and how do you know your definition of God is correct? If you don't accept the Bible, how do you know your interpretation and understanding of the Bible is correct? And who do you say that Jesus of Nazareth is? What historical information supports your idea of him? If a Christian later deconverts because of your SE conversation, how would you help them if they return to you for advice about what to do next? Are you at all concerned about the mental health of the interlocutors whose faith you're challenging? Do you conceal your atheism from your interlocutor? If so, why? And if you conceal your atheism, are you really giving your interlocutor fully informed consent about your intentions and questions in your conversation? And lastly, have you read Peter Bogosian's books? So if you are a practicing street epistemologist and would like to answer these questions, you can leave a comment. Please be civil if you do. Or you can email me personally at my public email, psalm1968 at gmail.com. And maybe we can set up a time to have a chat about them if you have a, a, an SE channel and you want to chat with me about it. Or if you want to just strike up an email conversation or whatever the case may be. Uh, about anything in this video, not just these questions, drop me a line.